I'm also going to be doing a second video. So a year has gone by, and I think it's time that I answer these questions. What's up? I'm Jonathan, and welcome to Maker Tales, where I'm sharing my maker journey to help you go further in yours. So don't forget to subscribe, hit that little bell icon, to never miss an opportunity to keep making. This video is all about doing a video commentary of my workshop build video, because to say that I got a few questions about it would be an incredible understatement. So I think the quickest way for me to answer these is to actually go through the video with you and answer everything that I can while going through it. Now, do keep in mind that this was my first ever major build and I've never built anything, so to speak, of this scale before. Now, before we jump in, I think we should just do a quick fire round of the most asked questions. Where are the electrics? Well, quite frankly, I was not qualified to fit in any electrical installation into my workshop because quite frankly, I'd rather not burn down the house. And I know that in the UK, if you don't put in electrics correctly, there is literally an unlimited jail sentence. So I'm not going to go ahead and do that. So I got professional to come in. However, now that I am fully qualified, I am going to tell you guys, make sure you get a professional to do this because there are a lot of hurdles that I had no idea about that I do know now. You realize your door is upside down, right? Yes, I realize the door is not only upside down, but inside out. So the whole point of this was I got this door for five quid. And quite frankly, it already had some cutouts of where the latches have been. It already had a keyhole and it was obviously going to be an inward swinging door and I didn't want that. So I wanted it to be outward swinging. I didn't want to go ahead and put a whole new hole into it. So I just decided, you know what? If the door rots and gets worse, I can just get a new one for a fiver. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it upside down and make it swing outwards so that I have the most space possible inside of my tiny little workshop. What exactly is your roof made out of? So quite frankly, my roof is just your basic shed felt. Now, the one thing that I have done is in my experience, shed felt is quite frankly bad and it doesn't matter how you put it on doesn't matter how much adhesive you put in there at some point especially when you're working with high winds and lots of weird weather hot cold and high winds that is just not going to last so what i used was black jack's all weather sealant and i gave it two coats all over of this bitumen paint and i can tell you right now I get gusts of up to Gale Force 9 on that roof, and I haven't had a single problem with it. This next one is a bunch of questions, which is, do you have a material list? Do you have the plans? What tools did you use? And how much did it cost? Well, in all honesty, the whole cost of everything, so this comes down to tools, the material, all of it, was about £2,200, but that includes all my Makita tools, even down to my hammers and mallets, everything is in that. Even my boots are in that. So the actual build itself was only about £1,200. And that included extra wood to build a workbench within the workshop itself. So if you think about it, the wood was about £900 and all the rest from the screws to the felt to the bitumen to the paint came to the rest of it, which in my opinion, isn't too bad. As for the materials themselves, the plans, all the information about the tools and all the rest, that's going to be a link down in the description as soon as possible. I might just put up a big list for now, but in the future, I will probably do another little video just explaining how the plans work. And I'll also be doing another video of how to go ahead and design your own workshop using Blender, which is a free 3D program which if you want to look at a head start on it right now, I have a free series teaching you how to use it for precision modeling. Lastly, just before we go out of tools, you, many people ask me, what is that little blue bit on the end of your Makita impact driver? And quite frankly, it's just a magnet. It holds the screws so that I can pretty much just place my torque screw on the end and just go for it. I don't have to use two hands. So that made it a lot easier when I was getting up on a ladder, going up in a weird angle to get things in. And that's all that is. It's a magnet. And 
Of course, the link to where to get that is down in the description as well. How long did it take you? Well, for me, it took me just about a month. But what I would actually say is in that whole month, there was only actually about 14 days of build time because there was a lot of rain when I was doing this. And on top of that, I filmed the whole thing. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of different shots to make this montage as cool as I could make it. And that took a long time. I would say the actual building of it, if I did not have to worry about camera or the weather that much, I think I could do this within a week, about seven days, a good long seven days. I would say anything from nine to 15 hour days, but it could 100% be done in a week. Now, I know a lot of you want to get a hold of the plans and the dimensions in a lot more detail. I can tell you this much. The dimensions are at two meters 90 by two meters 90, because then that gives me a little bit more of three meters and three meters. And the height at the maximum height is 2.49 centimeters because I have a build maximum of my local council which is 2 meters 50 because I am within 2 meters of a building. Now when it comes to the councils and all this, in all honesty your best bet is to go and check your own council website out because every single council has different regulations even down to the fact that if you're going to be building something to this stature you might even need building regulation depending where you are. So do keep an eye on that. And that's the best I can say because it really, it, it varies so much when I was doing my research on this. Okay, another burning question was everything is going to rot. Okay, I, I understand where that's coming from. So first of all, I need to let you know that all of the wood is C16 pressure treated wood, which means it pretty much has a shelf life of pretty much leaving it in water for about four years. Yes, that means it will rot eventually. So what I went ahead and have done is the entire building is something called a breathing building. So the moisture goes in and out of itself. This is why it doesn't have a plastic film all over it. I know there's many US builds that have this entire plastic film, but here in the UK and for this style of building, I was creating something called breathable walls. Apart from the floor, which is a moisture barrier using the king span, and in my best opinion, is hoping that I'm not going to have a big problem with moisture there, but I will explore that later on in the future when I'm going to actually cut open the floor and take a look how it is down in there. There is one little bad thing that I have done, which I'm sure many of you UK-based carpenters have seen it, that I put my breathable membrane and straight on my cladding. What I should have done is put my breathable membrane, some, um, what do they call strips, and then on top of those strips, which are gonna be about 15 to as much as 2.5 millimeters, no, 25 millimeters, there I put my cladding. So there's that breathable space as well. But I haven't had a problem yet. And the only problem that I did have, which I have had a lot of comments telling me about, is that I used pin nails to put the cladding on. Some of these pin nails did get pulled out because of the extreme cupping of the untreated wood. However, once the wood was treated, um, using some great Osmo outside oil treatment, the cupping basically relaxed and anything that had still pulled out the nail, I just went back and screwed them in with some small little screws and that sorted that out. And just before we move on from this rock question, which we will cover later on a little bit more, is the entire base is placed on rock slabs. And on top of those rock slabs is little squares of basically damp proof membrane to stop as much as possible that moisture transference. Of course, there still is going to be, and I created the entire base to be as drain away as possible. And that's the best I could have done because if I were to lift this up, the good 10 centimeters that it needed to be lifted up to not have the splashback problem, I just wouldn't fit in there. I'm a big guy, I'm six foot four. And with that slant to deal with my gale force winds and my height restrictions, I had to give somewhere and that was the floor. So that green floor that you're seeing as well is weather sealed. Um, house flooring, just your standard tongue and groove house flooring, which I'm hoping is going to be the most 
moisture combatant material that I have in this build. I did get asked quite a few times what software did I use to both design and organize this whole thing because I show you on my tablet what I had going on there. So first of all, I designed this whole thing in Rhino, but I realized Rhino is a 600 plus program that you have to pay for. So I'm actually switching everything over to Blender and I will talk more about Blender at the end, but there is a link down in the description if you want to learn more about it. Then as to how I organized it, all I did was within my 3D program, I just literally labeled every single piece of wood that I had. I created a giant spreadsheet using Airtable, which is my favorite sort of advanced Excel sort of program. And using that, I was then able to organize every single cut and almost have it all cut and ready for assembly, like a big Ikea build, so to speak. Why on earth did I use rock wool? So I've used rock wool mainly for sound isolation. Rock wool, well, quite frankly, sucks to keep things nice and warm and cozy, but it is awesome at sound isolation because of its density. And it's just, that's the main reason why. I'm in a cul-de-sac here. I'm gonna be hammering, sanding and all that. So I had to make sure that I made this as sound isolating as possible. Speaking of which, many people mentioned you have no ventilation. Now, here's the catch 22. Yes, I have no common ventilation, but remember my entire build is made out of a breathing structure. I've literally put in a humidifier in there and a humidity meter, and it's crazy how no matter what I do, it stays at one humidity, it stays at one temperature. The whole building just breathes in and out, letting all the moisture in, any moisture out. So it's very much in tune with its surroundings, especially being so small and being such a breathable building. With those burning questions now answered, let's go ahead and go through the whole video very quickly and just let you know how I went about doing things, things that I wish I knew, and a little bit of like behind the scenes of exactly what was going on. So for those of you wondering, that there is Jenny. She helped me with the entire build, but primarily she was at work. So she helped me as much as possible, but we wanted to get this done as quick as possible. So right here, we are basically leveling the ground. Right there, we have sub base and we found out that the ground was extremely hard. So later on, I go ahead and get myself a pickaxe where I go and dig out a little bit more around all the slabs that I placed down, but I didn't actually record this. So what we're doing here is basically we've marked out what the ground is gonna be. We're gonna to go to all the slabs. We're starting actually where we're having to basically lower the ground the most because that means we're just going to raise the ground up to the highest point there and that's pretty much what we're doing so that there is sub base which if you're not sure what sub base is it's a mixture of both big and small gravel and it's basically sort of like a construction base if this is the first time you've ever done any type of build thing like I was here I asked a lot of joiners and a lot of other DIY handy men to get this made. So here, once all the slabs were in, I went around all the edges and made sure that they were really compact into place so that they wouldn't move in any way whatsoever. I also double checked the leveling of this multiple times and then I went around 
all of the slabs, like I said, and brought down the ground level and then just placed a little bit of gravel to let any water just run straight under without having any problem with that. As well as that, which I did not show, is I did create an entire about foot deep ditch around the entire structure and fill that in with fine gravel to create a drain away. So that there is all the wood and I keep getting asked, where did I get my wood? Well, quite frankly, I just went to my local timber yard. If there's any big builds going on, there's always going to be a timber yard somewhere nearby where you're going to get your best, basically bang for your buck. I used myself HIS and they're based up near Inverness and that there is where I got my wood. So right here you can actually see what I have is these and these and that and that. These here are the primarily the timber that I use which is 95 by 45 C16 timber. Then I've got my cladding here and then here is my base which is 145 millimeter by um, 45 so they're the same width and that is my base material. Then up here is all my OSB that I've used mainly for my inside because I was doing a breathable wall. This here is the software. So right here, this is Rhino. Um, so all here is done in sort of line drawings because I did the entire thing in there, but I will be doing an entire video on how to do this within Blender. And I will be redesigning the exact workshop in Blender from the ground up and you can then do this for whatever workshop you're wanting to do. I'll do just a series just on shed design building in Blender to teach you how to do it. And then here in the background, this is Airtable and all the links to all this stuff will be down in the description. And also just a heads up, this here is a UE Boom, which in my opinion is one of the best Bluetooth speakers out there. and very much worth its So what I did do here is I did cut everything beforehand from the inside to the outside. It was all cut beforehand and this is why you're about to see a pile of wood that has all those numbers already on. Also, keep in mind when you're doing this, what we're doing here is checking the crown, which is how does the wood bend? So when you're wanting to work on the flooring, you very much want every single piece of wood, no matter how great it is, it's going to have a crown to it. So when you look down it, it's going to have like a bend upwards and that there, you want that to be where you're putting your flooring onto, because if you do it the other way, with time, you're gonna get a dip in the floor. As well as that, when you're doing walls, you want the crowns all to go in one way, or it's either inwards or outwards. It's up to you, really, at that point. Same with the roof, you want the crowns to be upwards, so then you get more of a, a splay outwards and then a dip in. So keep in mind, that's what we're doing right here, is checking the crowns, and that's why we have an arrow on all the pieces of wood here, because that lets us know where the crown is.
So with the base down, this is the weed membrane. This is just to stop anything from growing up. This isn't sort of a legal requirement by any sense, but it's just common courtesy to not build right against the property line. So that there is a 60 centimeter piece of wood that I decided I was gonna keep away from the property line itself. Something to keep in mind as well is, you can't see it in this, but I'm about seven meters away from a road. And if you're closer than five meters from a road, there are other regulations you've got to keep in mind. Here is a good one where you can see, here I have BA. So B stands for base or back, R is right, L is left, F is front. And I think I've got another one which is, um, I can't remember, T for top as in the roof. And here you can also see the arrow that shows where the crown is of all these pieces of timber. Now you don't have to use spats, I just, quite frankly, I found these screws on a great deal of the day, um, but now they're very expensive and quite frankly as long as you can find um, ones that have quite a big shank, and what I mean by that is that you've got a big long screw and then the end of it where there's no thread is at least the width of your wood, so 45 millimeters for this one, because that lets you press your pieces of wood together. You also wanna get the ones that have this flat head on the screw part, because if it is tapered in, it's going to spread apart your wood and split it instead of compressing them together. There it is, the, that is the little Makita drill bit that this is the torsion Makita mag something, the link will be down in the description, and this literally is just a magnet that moves up and down a little bit, and it spins around, and it's very easy to clip on and clip off, and I found it invaluable because it just made screws stay there. It also stops you over tightening screws because once the wood, it can't touch the thread anymore, that blue bit is actually gonna stop your drill bit interacting with the, so to speak, this, the screw that is out of reach. Let's see here, you can see that I have the damp proof membrane on all the sections where it is actually touching the ground. And right here, I've already dug away, so there's a good centimeter or an inch or sometimes two inches where there's just sort of airflow. So this here is the king span, and yes, I don't really know much about this part, but I did see lots of builds before doing this, and also talked to quite a few people and asked them what they felt about this. And I don't know if it's right or wrong, and we will find out in the sort of like an inspection video that I'll be doing, where I will cut a hole in and we'll see what's going on there. Because from what I'm aware, if you have a piece of wood and you have something that is basically fake, so like this um, king span, and you were to stick those two together, you just that teeny tiny little gap between there is sort of a moisture trap that's going to make things really hard to get out. However, in what I was thinking logically is that if I were to just leave a bit of air there, then at least the moisture trap is just on the king span and not my flooring itself. So yes, I could definitely still have moisture in there, 
but at least it's not going to affect my floor as much as actually touching the floor itself. This is why not only is it pressure fit super tightly, but I also seal around all of it using metal ducting tape. And this here is that flooring that I was talking about. This is just your normal construction, weatherproof flooring. And this is why it is green, because it has this treatment literally embedded into it. So what I was doing here when framing up itself, I just got all the timber that I knew from my plans and put them out on here. I did a check of the window sizes themselves and the windows, again, I got these from my local like scrapyard and I got them for an absolute steal. So that's why they're mismatched, a bit weird. I couldn't find a big window for the left-hand side. So I literally went and got two other windows from this scrapyard took the double glazing out and created a custom frame for them. So here is a very good example of something just to keep in mind if you're going to be doing this on your own. You'll see down here, I have these little pieces of wood. This is going to make your life so much easier if you're doing this on your own, because all you have to do is bring it up, press it against those pieces of wood, and then you know you're at the right edge to go ahead and just screw it right into your base. I've also had people ask me, why did I put the joists on top of the floor? From my understanding, this is sort of normal construction when it comes to timber builds. I don't know if it's different when it comes to brick builds, but this is pretty much how it's done here in the UK. Um, I, I don't see how you would be able to support a 95 millimeter joist on only a 45 millimeter beam when you've got a much bigger surface area once you've got the floor in itself. Yes, it does mean that changing over the floor is a lot harder, but everybody that I asked when it came to joinery told me this was the right way to go about it. Again, I'm just learning and this is just me sharing my experience. Now I've had many people ask me, how did I get this angle and what angle is that? Well, within building regulations, the minimum angle I think is five degrees. I could have done this as a flat, I, I didn't need to. But on this side here, I have an open field and I get crazy gale force winds coming off there. So I decided what well, I was gonna give myself is a seven degree pitch there just to make sure that it gives the roof basically the best chance to survive some of these gale force winds. As for actually finding the bird mouths of the roof and all the rest, that's I'll explain that all within the 3D program, but you can literally just Google this and it's just using basically a protractor to find out your angles.
and there's that drill bit once again you'll see that it won't let me go off and that was a perfect example why you need all this here to be a shank on the screw to literally pull these two pieces of wood together. Just as a heads up here, what you're not going to see is what I go ahead and do here is actually I get some scrap bit of wood and I place it right along this edge here. This is the point where I wrap the, the felt over it like this. The reason why I'm doing that bit is because that gives me now a little taper that lets any water drip down from it. I didn't know this at the time that that was what I needed. And in all honesty, if I were to redesign this, I would actually make the roof quite a bit further out, maybe another five centimeters out, because it got really tight really quickly once I had that lip over. And this here is that breathable membrane, also known as, what is it called? I forget what it's called, but this basically, it lets moisture, some moisture get through it, but it is waterproof at the same time. It lets air through it, but not moisture as much, especially not rain. Now, I do want to point out here, you're going to see this line. This is an overlap line. You can buy these already with a tape on there, but you can also go ahead and buy the tape separately. Now, this is extremely expensive tape that you're about to see, but it's basically a special type of tape that is both moisture resistant, extremely sticky, and it is also reinforced for basically all weather conditions. So that is something very important if you are going to be doing this. If not, the moisture is just going to go up through these holes. That's the tape. That's the tape right there. And it's crazy how expensive this tape is. I think it's about almost a pound a meter. Very expensive. Now it's at this point that everything is basically wind and water tight. And this is how I was able to carry on doing some work within the build while it was not such great weather on the outside. This is just why I wrapped the whole thing as quickly as possible because this just meant it could deal with Scottish weather. It's at this point that I did my biggest mistake. As you can see, I've just gone ahead and placed this right against the, the basically the breathable membrane, when what I should have done is put a whole bunch of battens across and then on those battens put the cladding. So I missed one step and I will at some point, I think, I'll just take all the cladding off, put some battens on, because it's not that big of a deal really. Um, because all it really has to do is I pull off this cladding, some might snap, some might not, and maybe I'll buy myself a couple of pads to deal with the ones that I break, 
but that's the only part that I think I really crucially got wrong. So keep in mind that at this point, this wood is completely untreated on the outside. This wood is going to get treated later on using something called Osmo, which I'll have a link down in the description for it as well. Here's that normal roof felt. I used an oscillator to do this. Now, I've been told that you can use pretty much anything. I just sort of thought, well, I've got one that has a pretty much screwed up blade anyway, so I went and used that on it. It did cut it like absolute butter, um, but I don't know if there's a better alternative to this, but that's what I did here. Right there, just let's go back to that. Right here, that is that little edging that I put all around to let me wrap the felt down and under it. And then I used an uh, electric nail gun, pin gun more than anything, to go ahead and secure the felt up in there. As well as that, I went and got myself some spare OSB and chucked it up in there. Because that is so important to make sure that the water doesn't basically follow the build and go into your workshop. That's the adhesive that I've put along all the edge of the felt, also where the nails were. And here you'll see me basically cutting off and trimming off any edge and putting pin nails under that. Again, the oscillator is amazing. I really highly recommend everyone to get one of these because it lets you do some really interesting things very easily. And here's that lovely door. As you can see, it already has a hole in it, right? Come on, mouse, where are you? I've lost my mouse here. There's already a hole going right through it here. As well as that, you can see that it already has places for me to place these, what are they called? To place the hinges in. So. I sort of had no real thing because on top of that, the build was quite high up. So I'm a tall guy. Yes, I could have fitted this door perfectly fine and I could have put in my little combination, open it up. But I also had Jenny and it was just a little bit too uncomfortable for someone to pull it up here. So just putting it upside down made life so much easier for everyone. And yes, this is an interior door. I did give it a coat though of bitumen paint up at the top to seal it completely and underneath to seal it completely and a layer of this Osmo as well on it to basically just give it a little bit more of weather protection. And this here is the blackjack all weather bitumen sealing paint that I did two coats on. Now, things to keep in mind with this. First of all, you can see that all the nails, I've already gone and put adhesive bitumen paint on all of it. So it's pretty much sealed up already. I did leave this here like this for about a week and I did get water seeping through. So somewhere 
I really think it was wind-driven water going up the seams because my trading wind was going this way and really pushing up on my roof. So that's where I think it was. But as soon as I put this bitumen on, it was sorted. Now this bitumen is quite expensive, smells a lot. Make sure you wear safety glasses because if you get this in your eye, you're screwed. Um, so thankfully I had safety glasses and I did have splatters on there. Uh, this was also a, almost a Gale Force 7 wind when I was doing this, so it's a little bit dangerous. Um, keep it really well mixed. Um, you can use even a broom to put this on because it is super thick and you're going to go through it so quickly on the first layer. It's incredible how much it soaks in. And make sure, make sure, make sure, make sure that your roof is dry before you put this on. Um, literally, as soon as you put that bitumen on, your roof is waterproof. End of. Like, it's waterproof, which means there's no water going in and there's no water going out. So if you already have a water problem, deal with the problem before you put this on. And as you can see, that is the result of this bitumen paint. It is literally a water repellent, i.e. a jacket for your roof. Here's where you get to see I put a huge drainage ditch down here because I was getting a little bit of moisture problem here, but that was also when I didn't have the rain catch as well. Rain catch the gutter as well. So I wanted to cover all my bases and that's where I did this giant, giant drainage hole all the way around the work. There's the DIY window that I was talking about. Yes, it's not the prettiest, but I got basically a timber window for the equivalent of a fiver again. And yes, I do realize that this lock is not exactly the safest out there, but I'm gonna be perfectly honest, I don't really keep my tools in here. I keep my tools in the house, not in the workshop, because it's a very high paced environment in there. I'm probably going to upgrade it in the future, but just keep in mind that this is quite a locked down backyard anyway. Like to get up here, you have to pretty much get up a 50 degree slope. So I don't think anybody's gonna go up a 50 degree slope, a seven foot fence, and then go into here and then somehow take something. Rock wall. So this rock wall is our RW45 Rockwall 100 millimeter slabs of 120 millimeters by 600 millimeters. So it's made for the spacing between um, joists. And this is the whole reason why I went with 95 millimeter studs. I should have gone with 100, but I couldn't because technically I've had to compress this rock wall. And with the compression of rock wall, you lose a bit of its properties as well. So it was just something that I had to do both for cost and just for the sake of ease because it actually was quite hard for me to find the rock wall. When it comes to rock wall, yes, it is technically sustainable, but not really. It is, keep in mind that this is basically steel slag that's been turned into a candy floss of steel. So wear gloves, wear a mask, protect yourself at all costs from this stuff. Once it's in the wall, you're sorted, but putting it in can be very painful. And quite literally, I had little tiny shards of metal that I was pulling out of my skin when I accidentally did some of this work without the right protection. As well as that, you will see here that I have a wavy saw and that saw is incredible for cutting rock wool. That, that saw just is cut through Kingspan like no tomorrow and it cut this rock wool like a hot knife through butter and that is something that I was so happy about because that stopped so much of the, the tiny horrible mess that you can get with rock.
This here is that sealer, the oil sealer of Osmo that is linked down in the description. You put a couple of coats of this on the outside and you're good for a few years. Now, many people have said, hey, what's up? Your end grain is like showing here and you haven't really closed that up. But don't worry. What I basically do is I went to my lumber yard once again. I got myself some really nice thick bits of timber and I just cut into them so that I could create my own custom corner stud, so to speak, for my workshop. Now, I decided that I didn't want, I wanted these to sort of like, I guess rot, change color, compared to everything else not changing color. So those le were left untreated. However, this here, I did treat the base of them though, so that they wouldn't rot too much on their end grain. But all the end grains of the cladding is sealed up. And here, you might be wondering, what is all this? Well, I basically just went with some wood filler and some thick gap filler here. This is the stuff that is basically to fill up plaster walls with, that have holes that are more than 50 millimeters deep. So I could just go at it with this. Remember to just fill it, let it dry, and then go again and then sand it down because that's going to be your best result. The reason why I was doing this, I didn't want that many seam lines all over my my basically my walls and um, with all this osb and i didn't really want to keep this as osb because it's quite full on on the eye so here it was just sealing it all up before i painted it and when it comes to the painting all i used was white emulsion paint that you just get your local dealers and just a lot of time and a lot of layers this i think at, at the end i had five layers of paint remember do even thin layers to get it to just dry as quick as possible in fact i had a little extraction fan well not a little one uh, a blower blowing fresh air into here to really get the airflow going to dry as quick as possible And here you have it. So you can see that I went ahead and I put some edging around things. And of course here are also my edges that I've got of my sealed, basically the end grain of my cladding. Now I did do some very big mistakes here actually. Um, I used ungalvanized steel um, nails to put in these last finishing touches and I didn't treat this wood. So this wood, which I'll show you in another video. The workshop's looking a little bit worse for wear on the outside, just of these bits. I've got to change them around and I've got to actually treat it out nicely. But all the rest of the workshop, top notch. I did have one other problem, which was right here on my DIY window. I realized that I had to angle this downwards like I have it for this one because I did have water pooling in. So all I did was I cut it downwards and then I put some bitumen paint across there to make sure the water just ran out of there so I didn't have to worry about any water running in. Um, apart from that, that's pretty much how the build looks right now. Of course, we did do a little bit of gardening around. You can also see here my little OSB that I went and chucked in up in that little gap to really basically force the felt to stay in place. This is after many, many, many layers of paint. And you can see here is my, basically the extraction fan, not really extraction, a blower, just blowing fresh air in to get it to dry out as quick as possible.
they might not realize, but right here, this is almost the tallest part of my workshop. I only have maybe 20 centimeters above my head, or a little bit more, probably 30 centimeters above my head. And that's why I didn't really lift up the floors. And with that, I hope that answers as many as your burning questions that you might have. I know there's always going to be more, so please leave them down in the comments down below, as I really do want to answer everything I can possible and really help you out in your own maker projects. Now, a big takeaway from this is understand that I personally still don't feel like I know what I'm doing here. This is my first ever big-ish build, and I did many mistakes, but I pushed through it and made something at the end. The key thing I would say here is plan, plan, plan. Plan for the best case, plan for the worst case. Like for me, my worst case scenario is my floor rots away. Well, how do I fix that? Well, I built the entire workshop so that I could literally take it apart and put it back together within two weeks. So I could literally take this whole workshop apart with screws and then go ahead and put a new floor in there and then put it all back together. Of course, in reality, I don't think I would have to do that, but it's something to keep in mind. And I think that's gonna be the best way to go about going with your builds. For those that are wanting even more information on this build, it will be coming soon. It's gonna be coming out with the entire series of designing your own workshop through Blender. So go and check that link down in the description. It's basically a series that not only will show you how to use Blender, which is the beginning precision series, but there's also the Blender in Action series where I will show how I go ahead and design this exact workshop using some plans that I've done before and put that into Blender. So then you can go and design your own workshops. With that, all links are down in the description. I just wanna say a huge thank you to all of you and to all of my patrons. You guys are absolutely awesome and it really means the world to me. And if you think I'm worthy of your support, I would love to see you there too. Thank you for watching, keep making, and let the quest continue.